Start again. So just uh, for everybody walking in, my name is Zachary Lamb. I'm a current pain medicine fellow at, at Sanford University. My initial training is in orthopedics and uh, as well as occupational medicine residency. This one I want to introduce kind of how I think about the occupational environmental medicine approach and how it can apply to uh, current pain practice. Um, so any uh, occupational environmental history talk has to kind of just at least, you know, give 30 seconds to the history. This is Hippocrates, um, kind of probably the first uh, noted in the literature of any type of, you know, potential occupational exposure, noticed uh, kind of a chronic illness among mercury sulfide workers, didn't really care for it or talk about treatments, but just kind of uh, observation. Uh, a little bit later, uh, you know, we probably more associate this with the, the beer, but Pliny the Elder, just uh, after the uh, 100 AD, uh, was the first one that kind of came up with occupational protections in terms of a, an animal mask uh, for uh, uh, mines. And then a lot of the modern history of occupational environmental medicine, especially the regulations, come from uh, disasters and catastrophes. And this is kind of one of the most famous ones that kind of spurred the modern area, modern era. Uh, and it was the uh, Shirtwaist Company fire. And so you can see primarily a female workforce here uh, kind of sitting at their workstations uh, doing sewing. And the management had the terrific idea that if they locked the doors from the outside, then they couldn't leave and take breaks, um, which uh, worked from that. But when there was a fire, unfortunately, uh, nobody could escape and uh, 146 uh, perished in this accident, kind of led to the first uh, overhaul of uh, codes of um, egress of uh, you know, occupational standards, uh, led to uh, 36 laws reforming kind of state labor codes after that. And so you know, I can't talk uh, about occupational medicine without just saying that, you know, the field is a, ultimately a preventive medicine field. It's, it's, it's rooted in root cause analysis. And so, you know, my takeaways in terms of a pain practice is if you have, you know, uh, an outcome, an unexpected outcome, or you have a, a patient that actually, every time they tell you, it seems like they go and do this certain activity, whether it's, you know, skiing or, the, or their mother-in-law visits and their pain flares, uh, taking the time and saying, well, hey, is there a pattern here? Is there a way we can get to what the underlying uh, cause was and help prevent it so we're not kind of just treating the symptoms or the problems that stem from the underlying underlying cause? Uh, it's a really good uh, way to, in terms of quality improvement products, uh, projects in your practice to kind of stay up to date and kind of uh, uh, intermittently perform these root cause analyses. But I want to talk uh, a little bit, uh, and this is basically to say it's kind of root cause analysis says it's more effective to systematically prevent and solve for underlying issues than just kind of treating the ad hoc symptoms and putting out fires. So sometimes in pain practice, it feels like we're just treating the symptoms and putting out fires. And so if we can find a way to kind of get to the root cause, is there, you know, uh, catastrophizing, is there underlying uh, dissatisfaction with their workplace, with their life, uh, that probably can make our uh, treatments that much more effective. Um, I want to talk about this uh, really interesting case. This was an actual case, a case that I had in residency. Um, this is a 17 year old actually, and had many clinic visits for these really intermittent symptoms of uh, hypertension, uh, basically a, a real uh, neuropathic neurologia pain in the uh, upper and lower extremities, really, really profound diaphoresis, like really, really, really sweaty. Um, I think I may even have a, a clinical photo here from him. But, well, not quite. Uh, that, but that's what he, I've literally never seen anyone so sweaty in my life. Uh, as when I when I first met this gentleman, it was pretty profound. I mean, he actually ended up developing skin infections from how uh, moist uh, he was. And so I met him actually on the inpatient side. Uh, uh, primary care had done um, MRI brains, and actually the thought process was that he had a pheochromocytoma that they just couldn't find on imaging when we when we met him. But um, I don't know, some intern or resident had the uh, idea to kind of consult occupational me environmental medicine service to see if there's anything else we could um, offer. And I can't take credit for this, uh, but uh, our med medical student at the time did the initial history. And it turned out that, you know, he actually wasn't very happy at home. And many days after school, he went to um, uh, a uh, abandoned or unused uh, parking garage. And he found this really cool uh, substance uh, that looked like you could play with it and you could, it would, uh, it was kind of quick silvery and everything. And so uh, he had been doing this for, for weeks and months. He would skateboard and kind of play with it. And um, uh, when he was on weekends, he didn't go visit the garage, but on weekdays, especially after school, he didn't want to hang out at home. And ultimately we checked his mercury level and it was through the roof. And so um, ultimately it kind of came down to this environmental history, kind of understanding that he was a little bit unhappy at home. There was challenges there, what he was doing with his free time. And so um, he ultimately got chelated and uh, had a, a, you know, uneventful recovery after that. 
Um, and so this is kind of just a call to action from this kind of short mini flash talk, just to kind of learn a little bit about the patient's life and work. And I really like this uh, figure that kind of, kind of puts it all together from kind of the inputs and the, the modulating factors and the outcome. And so you can kind of see the job stressors on the left, the individual factors, you know, things that may not affect you, but may affect somebody else, kind of um, supportive or buffering factors at the bottom. And then the psychosocial aspects kind of all kind of playing out to what are you're seeing in terms of the end symptoms and result in front of you. And I think we've all seen this kind of injury cycle and uh, that aspect, but you know, on that kind of inactivity, depression, helpless, uh, helplessness, the catastrophizing that we've heard from Dr. Darnell's work and so many others, um, that's kind of where that like occupational environmental history, I think can either amplify or buffer and be a, a supportive uh, uh, aspect. And so some really key takeaways in, in, in our brief time here uh, from the occupational literature is that um, employment is, is what we do for the large majority of our life, you know, and uh, especially if you if you meet a patient that's on uh, that's been dis on disability or been disabled for a period of time, that's a fundamentally different patient than a patient that's, you know, waking up every day and, and going to work. Um, and so if they are working, uh, kind of learning a little bit about their workplace, how much autonomy do they have to actually do complete the work that they require? Do they, do they have to sit at a desk? Do they get kind of 15 minutes and it's scheduled? Or do they have a little bit more flexibility? We know uh, from uh, the literature that if they have more control, if they have a little bit more uh, decision making, then they get better faster, they return to work. Um, and when you don't have those kind of uh, uh, social support or autonomy, uh, the, the patients are, are, have higher levels of pain, they're out longer and they ultimately have um, poor outcomes. And so how do I incorporate this into like a real clinical practice um, when, you know, you can do your social history and just kind of say, you know, what do they do for work? Yes, you're a teacher. Yes, you're a bus driver. Yes, you're, you know, you're an office worker or you work in, in software. But kind of these are some of the questions that I, I, I have when I kind of want to uh, dive into that, just kind of understand those job uh, stressors. And so a lot of the times I'll be like, tell me about your manager. Who do you report to? Do you like them? Is it, do you enjoy going to work? And I think you, you find out so much more about a patient to actually kind of dive into a little bit. And I actually can, if your, if your treatments aren't working and they're not getting better, oftentimes um, we, uh, you can discover a lot. And uh, even if it's not a work-related injury uh, per se. Um, on terms of the, the uh, personal risk factors, you can kind of see the kind of classic ones here on the left, but kind of how I uh, ask about it is, you know, are you doing the child care? Are you doing the cooking, the meal prep, uh, preparation? Uh, do, are you going to church? Are there religious act activities that you like to do? Uh, and then I almost ask him kind of like, who's at home? How do you spend time at home? You know, different, uh, is everyone in the, in the same bedroom? And it really is interesting kind of finding out kind of how people are actually living their lives when they're not, you know, in your clinic getting a refill or doing a procedure with you. Um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, I kind of group it and this is like a Mayo Clinic that I, I really like and it really helps to understand uh, the patient's approach to their work. Is it just a job that they, they go to work, you know, and they get money for it and that's, it's a transactional? Is it a career where they actually feel like, you know, maybe the current job they're in isn't great, but they can see it growing and they, they have some excitement about that? Or is it a true calling that, you know, even if they made half as much or they had to work twice as hard, it's truly, um, uh, it gives a sense of uh, fulfillment beyond any type of uh, uh, financial or monetary gain. And there's one isn't better than the other. You don't need to have a calling to have a successful um, uh, work life, but kind of understanding uh, how they fit in can help you kind of see that, okay, this is how I'm gonna approach their job satisfaction. If it's just a job and they're there for financial gain, you're probably not gonna um, get too much gain by kind of diving into you know, how they uh, can improve it, how they can kind of uh, ad advance on. Um, and then uh, uh, this is if, when, when you do kind of explore those uh, categories, um, uh, some of the things that can, you can help them if you want them to kind of further, uh, you, you sense that it could be a career, but they aren't really kind of engaged in it. You know, some aspects that can either um, help improve their, uh, uh, their enjoyment of work or Thinking about is there ways that you can you know change your tasks, rotate them up? Uh, can you uh, do you have time? Are you are there passionate things outside of work? Maybe jobs not great, but are there volunteer or other activities that you can get involved in that give you uh, more of the uh, uh, innate gratitude? Um, and so that's just what I kind of want to introduce the kind of basic uh, occupational environmental history background.